This week, a jury found Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes guilty of seditious conspiracy in connection with the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, Rhodes' conviction is now the most significant to emerge from the Justice Department's sprawling investigation into the insurrection. Just one day earlier, in a courtroom in New York, the white gunman who killed 10 black people in a mass shooting at a Buffalo supermarket uh, back in May pleaded guilty to state charges, including domestic terrorism. And both of these high-profile events came on the heels of Donald Trump's dinner with white supremacist Nick Fuentes. Historian Kathleen uh, Ballou argues that these events are all connected. She calls them, quote, part of the same story about a rising and militant white power movement right here at home. Joining me now to discuss this, Richard Benjamin, a cultural critic and author of Searching for Whitopia, an improbable journey to the heart of white America. And also with us, Catherine Stewart, New York Times contributor and author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Uh, it's great to have both of you with us. Rich, I'll start with you. Um, Stuart Rhodes, the first person to be found guilty of seditious conspiracy in decades, that just the charge of seditious conspiracy on itself is significant. Talk to us about the, the importance of this conviction. Um, great to be here. It's very important because that's the most serious charge and with the most serious penalty consequences for any of the January 6th insurrectionists who've been acquitted. And so hopefully it sends a signal to the legal system and to the Republican Party, just the, the degree and depth of evidence that has been collected and the consequences will be had for the insurrection, even though many politicians still to this day are not denouncing it with the degree of seriousness that it deserves. So I think that's good news generally for the country. Catherine, what, uh, what message does it send to other extremist groups when someone like Rhodes is held accountable on this seditious conspiracy charge? Because I think the broader question maybe most Americans would have is, well, who did he conspire with? Why is this not going to perhaps somebody higher than Stuart Rhodes? Well, it's really important to hold these uh, violent extremists accountable. Um, but frankly, they're not the only ones who are responsible for the disgraceful events of January 6th. Um, prior to uh, the attack on our Capitol, we had a whole number of folks, including many religious right leaders, who are spreading election lies, spreading Trump's election lies. Um, and uh, and so there was sort of um, that kind of conspiracism is something that Trump cultivated and many people either promoted themselves or, or tacitly went along with. Rich, um, you know, the testimony during the trial uh, outlined how people were drawn into the group. Uh, many cited the prevalence of election fraud claims, spending too much time online, uh, and a quote of sense of, uh, of both desperation and hopelessness, hopelessness, excuse me. Can, can this kind of testimony offer us clues on how to stop future indoctrination or perhaps even future uh, radicalization into this movement? But here's the problem with this radicalization, is when you have a party that doesn't literally have a political platform, that doesn't literally have policy or solutions to the country's problems, in the absence of that lack of policy or solutions, what you do have is demagoguery, hate, and conspiracy theories, which are fed into people and so that is, I think, the tie that's binding them in. And so the deeper question is, what would the Republican do, Party do to what's on people's minds before, during, and after the recent elections? I think, to me, that's the more salient question, is what do you do with a party that doesn't believe in smart, effective government, and how mm. are they feeding into these conspiracy theories, which then also lead to violence? Catherine, um, historian um, Kathleen Ballou connected the Rhodes conviction, uh, the Buffalo shooter, and Trump's dinner with Nick Fuentes. She sees a common theme, perhaps, in all of these different events. What's your take? Do you see a, a thread between them? Absolutely. Look, um, and this isn't just about Trump. I think it's really important to step back and see just how much the Republican Party has changed in the past, say, 15 or 20 years. 
I think the Republican Party in the age of Bush and McCain might have had flaws, but it's hard to imagine they would have made room for this kind of domestic extremism and hate and conspiracism. Um, and yet that kind of conspiracism and, and hate now represents a very significant part of the Republican Party. Trump really enabled that because he violated a lot of the rules, the sort of tacit rules that um, that tend to hold a pluralistic democracy together. And that's how he he represented the lawlessness of the authoritarian. Um, he operated for four years with a sort of performative cruelty. And that appealed to the grievances of a lot of his supporters. And, um, you know, it's not just about him anymore. Now a lot of uh, sort of narcissists and celebrities have seen that that and, and wannabe politicians are seeing that that's the key to his appeal. And, and they're emulating a lot of that type of behavior. And, Rich, of course, the biggest fear is violence, right? It's one thing to hear white nationalist yeah. rhetoric. It's another to see the violence. On Wednesday, you had the Department of Homeland Security warning of domestic terror threats to the LGBTQ, Jewish, and migrant communities. One official told reporters that Americans uh, motivated by violent ideologies pose a, quote, persistent and lethal threat. Do you think that enough is being done to counter that threat when you see um, the, the level of violence that we've seen targeting various communities uh, and with different motivations, uh, sorry, with the same motivation in different areas? It's improving. So in the last administration for four years, we saw an administration that explicitly tried to excise white nationalism from domestic terrorist threat assessments. So that has changed, and that's caused for some cautious optimism. So things might improve, but the question remains to what extent these white nationalists, with a kind of tacit green light from above, are infiltrating local police departments and state police forces. And so this is something that the DHS is keeping its eye on. It must keep its eye on. But as Catherine said, it's, it's, it's all very related between the narcissism of these certain celebrities, the availability of gun violence, uh, a culture of violence that's propagated. So my hope is one of cautious optimism that things might improve. Uh, Catherine, where do you come down on this? Final thought from you. Where do you think this trend of white nationalism is heading? Do you share um, Rich's optimism? Well, unfortunately, I think there's been a sort of proliferation of a kind of language of, um, sort of exclusionary nationalism, uh, a sort of uh, who gets to properly belong in the country and who doesn't. There's a kind of mainstreaming of a certain type of um, extremism that provides this narrative uh, that the supposedly right kind of Americans are engaged in spiritual warfare. Um, uh, many of them have a stated goal, as Fuentes does, and uh, um, uh, of, of creating a kind of a theocracy. And this kind of ideology used to be, frankly, quite fringe in America. And it's pretty dominant now among ma ma militia groups, but you can see it elsewhere. Um, you can see um, echoes of it or even expressions of it um, throughout uh different factions of the Republican Party. So I think that this is um, something that we have to be aware of and, and be very concerned about. Yeah, I think I'm sorry, a yeah, quick, sorry quick, quick clarification. My cautious optimism is with the exercise of law enforcement, right. not with the general yeah. culture that Catherine's uh, describing. So yeah, I, no, ju no, I just I'm glad, I, no, I'm glad that you made that distinction. I, I felt that that's what you you were trying to say, and I, um, I and I apologize if in any way, shape, I, I was mischaracterizing. Mm. But I'm glad that you you clarified that. Rich Benjamin, uh, Catherine Stewart, thanks to the both of you. Greatly appreciated this conversation, an important one that I'm sure we'll continue to have.